Our Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful to be able to be here this evening. Thank you for those who have expressed an interest in your word. We pray, Father, as always, that it will not disappoint. May God the Holy Spirit direct us into truths that we can apply. In the name of our Savior, we pray. Amen. This is the fourth installment of a study that we have entitled The Evidence Testing of Job. It is an abbreviated study because the book of Job is uh, so long and uh, so big. Uh, we just went through and picked out the more salient features uh, with regard to his evidence testing. And uh, the reason that we're doing this is to teach some definitions of, of some terms that we pick up right here in this book. Uh, we find in the book of Job, which is the oldest book in the Bible, now, there are historical facts that Moses includes that are older than Job, but Job was the first book of the Bible in actuality. Uh, even though uh, uh, Genesis covers uh, the first things that happened in history. And we find in this first book something remarkable, that there is an angelic trial that convenes on a regular basis. The term sons of God here is a term we picked up way back in Genesis chapter 6 verse, uh, verses 1 and 2 when it says the sons of God came to the daughters of men and so forth. It has to do with the angels. They convene a trial. Lucifer comes up and uh, in this trial, God is the prosecution. He is prosecuting the, the angels and those human beings actually that uh, revolt with them. And uh, uh, the defense attorney is Lucifer. That is why he has the title. It's really not his name. His title is Satan, which means a, a, a trial attorney uh, uh, defending uh, criminals. An angelic trial convenes. Now here's what happens. God and Satan call witnesses to uh, testify on their behalf. And the other angels observe. Now, in all actuality, this is what's going on throughout history, where God calls people to the stand, Satan calls people to the stand, and uh, each of them examine and cross-examination these witnesses. Now, that um, is why we call the angelic conflict and its question with the trial a test case condition. It's not God just saying, well, Job can do this, or Christ can do this, it's actually putting them through the testing, uh, actually seeing what they are made of. And that's what this is all about. When we say we don't want to go through the sufferings and the hardships and the heartache, well, that's true, none of us do. But the fact of the matter is, we are witnesses in this trial. And one way or another, our number is going to be up and our name is going to be called. And you are going to swear to God that you're going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now, how are they going to get the truth out of you? They're going to put you through a test case condition to find out whether you can cut it or not, whether you can hack it, whether you can make it. And that's exactly what we find in the book of Job. Now, um, Job was called for evidence testing. And it means that there is a person alive that can testify that whether God blesses them or they're in the midst of adverse conditions, they are going to stand for him, live for him, testify for him, come what may. Now there's one man in the Bible that did that. There are others, of course, Jesus Christ and Paul, others we can name. But here is the first book of the Bible and what does it focus on but the angelic trial, test case conditions, and evidence testing of um, one of the most um, uh, mature, courageous believers that has ever lived. Now, we know this is true because we looked at his name in the book of Ezekiel. We're not going to do it now. But he is mentioned with two other fellows in a list of what we call pivotal heroes. God actually uh, says that these men delivered their generation until the generation got so bad that God had to close it out. Noah is given as, as an example of global disaster. By the way, uh, I believe that we're in, uh, the, uh, in for some global disaster real soon. 
And it's not uh, going to be what the environmentalists say is going to destroy this globe. I just watched a, a documentary uh, with regard to sunspots. And they believe that in the year 2000, the cycle of sunspots, which spawn sunstorms, which disrupt the Earth's environment and disrupt communication satellites and so forth, are going to be worse in, in that year than they have ever been. Uh, coupled with the potential problem of Y2K, the year 2000, with computers. Even if it isn't as big as some say, it's still going to be a difficult situation. And both secular and sacred people are saying we better prepare. I've got some people who, who have um, called me and emailed me. I know Pete Allen is, is real upset over this. He's ready to go to the hills there in Oregon and store water and store food, buy guns and so forth. That's Pete, you know, that's ridiculous. But, but some are saying to assume a survivalist um, mentality uh, with regard to that. Uh, and then, of course, um, we've got to what's going on here in the alignment of of nations, and that's going to happen. Russia is in trouble financially. We've got the Asian countries in trouble financially. We've got China as the sleeping giant beginning to awaken. We've got Islam on the march, and the whole reason that this guy, uh, I'm, I'm told on the radio, that this guy has bombed our embassies, he is a an avowed hater of the United States of America, and he wants death to the infidels. The way he's going to do that is to disrupt our oil flow and businesses abroad by threatening our citizens there to unite Islam. Now, at this point, Islam is not united, but just think, if they could get the Afghanis, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Gaddafi's group there in Libya together, I mean, you've got a formidable force not only in manpower, now they don't have the technology we do, that's true, but not only in manpower, but in oil-rich uh, countries that could definitely cause some problems. So I see some difficulties before this age is, uh, is over. Then you have Daniel listed. He was saved despite national disaster. He was one of the few uh, that were brought up in the Trail of Tears from Jerusalem to, to Babylon. Then you have Job, he was saved despite personal disaster. And we saw this in the eye of the storm concept where believers are kept in the calm and they are protected as the storm rages round about. But now here's an exception to the rule. Operation Hedge is for mature believers. God puts a hedge around us for protecting us and providing for us. But in the angelic conflict, there is an exception to the rule. And as much as we pray about it, like Paul did, for the thorn to be removed, we can pray, dear God, to don't go through this. The problem with that is if we don't go through the testing, we don't get the reward. Because that's the only way God and Satan and the angels know what we're made of. We have to go through the tests. As unpleasant, as uncomfortable as they are, the hedge has to be removed by God himself. It was God himself who said, have you considered Job? Uh, Job knew about it. He said, oh, Lord, uh, I'm not ready for this. Oh, God. But he had to be. Uh, and when it happened, it, it hit him, took him by surprise. But he understood doctrine that we'll see here in just a little bit. And that is why mature believers do these things. And for those uh, who were not with us, these are important concepts Mature believer equates living with dying. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I want Christ to be magnified in my body, whether by life or death. Prosperity with adversity. I've learned to be content in all states, says the Apostle Paul. And it's only when you come to this point in your life that you are spiritually mature. Uh, the world is not like that. So we learn a principle. If plus R, or God's righteousness, condones something, justice blesses it. But if God's righteousness condemns it, justice curses it. But there are exceptions. Number one, suffering for blessing, which is the story of Job. Job got double blessing in the end. But why did God multiply his blessing? Because God called upon him to suffer for the, for the cause. And that's an important concept. Without that, Job would not have been blessed doubly. 
he would have had a certain amount of blessings, that's fine. But here you have double blessings. Uh, and Job had to lose everything before he gained it twice back. And then the second thing we learn as an exception is prosperity for cursing. All the wealth in the world to an unbeliever is actually a curse. Oh, you say, Pastor, wait one second. They've got it easy. Yes, that's true. But they leave it all behind. They have to live in fear that they're not going to enjoy that wealth forever. It's not wrong to have wealth if you are a believer like Job and have it in its proper place. How did he answer the first evidence test when God took away his wealth? The Lord gave, the Lord took away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Hey, I came into the world naked, I'm going to go out the very same way. Uh, God, God gave and he took it away, I'm about to meet him anyway. Who cares? You know, uh, I, I knew that it was temporary when I began to, to see what the world was like. So that's suffering for blessing. But prosperity for cursing is if you are a rich person, you cannot keep those riches forever. And you're going to end up and go to hell and burn and burn and burn in a the poverty stricken state and, uh, and uh, that is never going to end. So prosperity is really not a blessing if it keeps you from Christ, if it keeps you from spirituality. And you have to keep that in mind, especially when, you know, somebody hits a $190 million Powerball and doesn't have to work again the rest of their lives. But um, be that as it may, we're in the book of Job. And uh, we're now looking at uh, and I'm sorry I'm, I'm uh, sorry I colored these things the way that I did because they don't come up on the screen as vividly as uh, as they should have but you have a copy and we're looking there therefore at the evidence testing of Job and where God places a divine hedge around now we we talked about Job's surrounding circumstances or his wealth but the second evidence test involved his health and I mean to tell you, this guy really had bad health. There wasn't a doctor alive at that time that could help this guy. Uh, he was sick from the inside out. Not only that, he was mentally battered by a wife who didn't give him any uh, spiritual support. And uh, he was in a, a miserable state. And despite that, you know what he said? You're talking, speaking to his wife, is one of the foolish wisdom, uh, uh, foolish women speaks. They had no wisdom. Foolish. But he said, uh, shall we not receive good and bad from the hand of God? In other words, it rains on the just and the unjust. The sun shines on the just and the unjust. That's part of the angelic uh, conflict. And sometimes we're going to have to go through this period of testing. And each time, the first and the second evidence test, he answered with a specific doctrinal concept, or we would say even a verse of scripture, a principle, a precept, or what have you. Now, this morning, uh, Miss Betty, I'm, I, I really am uh, uh, sorry. I, this morning, uh, Miss Betty had a friend, and, and we've been praying for him, and we'll continue to do so. But um, he, he gave a false doctrinal concept, and I, I pressed him on the issue. Uh, and uh, I said, well, can you explain this to me? Well, he said, well, I've just got faith. And I said, but that's blind faith. And of course, I could tell he probably reads a whole lot of Norman Vincent Peale, uh, which is uh, positive thinking. You know, you get these little guidepost books, save them and start your fires with them in the wintertime because they are worthless books. They are blasphemous with regard to doctrine. Now, the, first, the reason I know what, why he's reading those, because it was positive thinking. I just, I just believe God is going to turn out all right. And, uh, and I said, that's, that's not true. It is positive faith perception. It is bringing up a verse of scripture, just like Job did, or a doctrinal concept, and clinging to that. That's positive faith perception. 
bringing it up because he knew it. And so when I asked some of these various things, of course, he, he did not know. And I pressed the issue simply because he, he pressed that he did know God was going to take care of it. Everything is going to come, come, uh, come out all right. Uh, you know, the Romans 8.28 principle. Uh, but that's not true. Now, if somebody says, Pastor, you're off base. I just simply refer you to the billions of people who are in hell right now, who had a religion, who had a faith, who had a belief in God, but who are Christ rejectors and doctrinal rejectors. Are things all right with them right now? They are not. It's not going to turn out all right. I don't care how much positive thinking you have, it will not be okay for you. There's only one way that it's going to be okay for you, and that is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and bring up doctrine to life and live by it. Then God works all things together for good to them who love him. So I'm afraid I, I, I probably pushed in wanting an answer, but um, if you don't have a frame of reference, if you're not used to doctrinal study and you're pushed for an answer, of course, that... Uh, can bring um, embarrassment. And I didn't mean to do that, but I'm afraid I did. So um, I said all that uh, to, to say, Job has a doctrinal answer for life. When called upon to witness, he didn't just say, well, God's going to make it better. He said, Naked came out of the womb, naked I'm going to return. The Lord gave, the Lord took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's doctrine to life. When the Lord took away his health, he said to his wife, we're going to receive both good and bad from the hand of God. What, what's wrong with you? Don't you understand that concept? And in all these things, Job did not charge God foolishly, and he did not sin with his lips. Now, that is a fantastic believer who knew what was going on both in front of him visibly and behind the scenes invisibly, and he answered life with doctrine. And that's what it's all about. Learning, 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 living, living, living. So that brings us then to the final phase, the third evidence test of Job. And that was with regard to his spiritual confidence. Now, might I say, in, in this um, arena here, that Satan finally got to him. You know what a filibuster is? It's when somebody of the opposite party gets up and starts talking and talking and talking, all in an attempt to, to run the time out so that uh, the bill that the other party wants to pass, you don't have time to vote on it. That's a filibuster. Well, Satan tried to wear Job down by continuing the cross-examination. Now, what does the other attorney have to do when the one attorney is cross-examining the witness? He has to remain silent. And Job eventually had his confidence in God shaken because it took God so long. But God said, now remember, if Job had just simply recalled this principle, God will not suffer us to be tested above that you're able. So even though Job was at the end of his rope, he thought, God knew that he could take stand just a little more, and so he let him go through this test. Have you ever wondered sometimes why God doesn't instantly answer? We give the word prayer, and boy, we expect it, you know, tomorrow things are going to be better. We've taken you know, the, our Aladdin's lamp out, and we have just rubbed it, and God the genie appeared. Now, God, you do this, three wishes, thus and so, thus and so. But it doesn't happen that way. God kept silent. And the longer God kept his mouth shut, Job got bitter because he was doing it right. Why don't you vindicate me? Why? You know, that sort of thing. So here we have satanic pressure in the area of spiritual confidence. Over the long haul, will Job last? And he faltered here in this uh, third evidence test. Here we are in chapter 2. Verse 11, Job's three friends heard of all the evil that came upon him. They came every one to his own place. Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, as I mentioned, this is the shortest man in the Bible, uh, Shuhite. Zophar the Namathite, 
they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him, to comfort him. When they lifted up their eyes, they knew him not. Uh, they lifted up their voice and wept. They rent their mantle and so forth. They sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights. None spoke a word. His grief was very great. Now, how long did Job's suffering last? Well, we know that it lasted at least um, seven days, but probably several months. These, uh, these men stayed with him. They were not very good comforters, and we'll see that in just a little bit. But you know, think about this. Think about this guy, Job. He didn't know that God was going to restore him twofold. He still kept his integrity. If God would have restored his health, what still would that have meant with regard to his wealth? He still would have been a pauper. He'd had to get all up and start all over again without complaining, without grumbling, without bitterness. That's difficult. Being a grumbler myself, sometimes it is rough saying, oh God, why don't you do this? Here we are serving you and this is right and I know I'm right and the world does this and uh, so. How do we know Job began failing this test? Well, after this opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. This is uh, verse number one of chapter three. Job spake and said, let the day perish when I was born. And the night in which it was said, there is a child, a man child conceived. Let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above. Neither let the light shine upon it and so forth. And he goes on, verse number eight, let them curse it that curse the day who are ready to raise up in the morning. And uh, he says here, verse number 11, why died I not from the womb? Why didn't I give up the ghost? What is he becoming here? He is becoming bitter because his grief is being prolonged. Uh, he is uncomfortable in his misery, and he expects God to answer him and get him out of this mess. And God keeps quiet. Let's uh, look at chapter 13 of this book. Chapter 13 of this book and verse number 4. Now, after Job speaks and sort of vents all of his bitterness, curses the very fact that he's living, he wanted to be dead at the point of his birth. Now, that shows a guy that is beginning to get bitter. I'm going through all of this. I just wish I'd have died at birth. I wouldn't have known anything and gone on to heaven. That'd have been the end of it. Wouldn't have to be put through this misery. He wanted to be put out of his misery or for God to answer in some way. Now, to add insult to injury, his wife was against him and his three comforters came and they were against him. Now, now here is the upshot of this and we mentioned it last Sunday night. They immediately assumed he was guilty of some sin. I, I know that's the way I would have been. Was judgment this severe? Boy, uh, this dude has, has performed a major sin in his life uh, to have deserved all this. But the point is, that's wrong. If we know that he is a mature believer, to immediately assume that he has sinned is wrong. They should have come there and asked him, now look, is there anything in your life that you've done to bring this on? If he said no, then the next thing is, let's pray that you have the grace to, to, to see you through this. Now that's the grace attitude, especially if he is a friend. You don't assume guilt. You ascertain it first, and then based on that information, you proceed to give him help. These men didn't do that. They just sat down there and said, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. So he comes in verse 4 and says, you're forgers of lies. Because he told them time and again, I'm not guilty. You're all physicians of no value. They came there to comfort him, to cure him, to help him. They, they charged a bill and didn't, didn't do a thing for him, you know. Um, take two aspirins, call me in the morning. And it did not help. 
Come with me to chapter 32. Chapter 32. And verse number one. Now, after all of this prolonged conversation of these three men accusing him of something he did not do, he would answer them by saying, no, no, really, I, I didn't sin. This came out of the blue. I was doing God's will when it happened. And they still just simply said, no, you've got to be a sinner. So these three men finally ceased to answer Job. Why? Because he was righteous in his own eyes. I mean, after all, I mean, they really tried to dig into this man's life to figure out what in the world caused such an awful judgment of health and wealth as he's sitting there in his misery. Now, Job begins, as so we go back to chapter 19, Job begins to get real bitter. The Bible warns against a root of bitterness springing up and causing problems. Now, it's, it's not wrong to sigh in discomfort uh, as, as you're going through the agony. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he stumbled under the weight of the cross. In the garden, he cried, if this cup could pass from me, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure that, that there was a groaning whenever he was beaten and smacked and so forth. Uh, but he didn't open his mouth and complain. And that was the evidence testing here of Job, which he should have done. But note, he began to blame God. And here's where he went wrong. Then Job answered and said, verse 1, How long will you vex my soul? Break me in pieces with words. These ten times ye have reproached me. Uh, ye are not ashamed that you make yourselves strange to me, he's answering his friends. If indeed you will magnify yourselves against me and plead against me my reproach. But know that God has overthrown me and has compassed me with his net. In other words, now he's saying it's God who's doing this. This is all God's fault. Why in the world did God get me into this mess? Why did he mention my name, the angelic conflict? Now, the reason that I bring this out is because it is a potential danger for us. We want smooth sailing. And all of a sudden, our routines are disrupted. All of a sudden, things don't go the way we think they should go. Um, our plans go uh, awry. And things begin to get um, hot and heavy with regard to satanic pressure. Note what he says in verse 7. Behold, I cry out of wrong. Now this is a, a, a blaming God. God's doing this to me and I think he's wrong. I've lived for him and now I'm going through this. I'm not heard. In other words, he's praying, dear God, get me out of this. Dear God, I have lived for you. Dear God, what's wrong with you? You're unjust to me. And so Job begins to fail this third evidence testing, confidence in God. I cry aloud, verse 7 says, but there is no judgment. He has fenced up my way that I cannot pass. He has set darkness in my paths and so forth. He has stripped me of my glory, taken the crown from my head. He destroyed me on every side and I'm gone. Mine hope has he removed like a, a tree. So on and on he goes with this business of God has done this to me. God is wrong. And he's uh, failing the third evidence test. Now, let's go from here to chapter 23. Now, we're, we're about to have two competent judges give Job the true answer that he needs for this third evidence test. For a man who had such flying colors here in, under the circumstances and his, uh, and his physical condition, now to fail like he's doing is a shame. But um, everybody seems to have their limit, and Job was coming to the end of his rope. 
Job 23, verse 1. Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him. I would fill my mouth with arguments. Now, this again is Job saying, I wish I could go to the very presence of God. Because if I'd go there, I would state my cause before him and say, hey, wait, look, you're not being fair with me. He was going to argue with God about this business. That's, that's the depths to which he had sunk because of his misery. Now, it's possible for a mature believer to fail and become reversionistic. It, you could fail and get out of fellowship and complain and then get back in fellowship. But Job was letting this thing go back the other way. And that's what reversionism is. He began blaming God. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but... He would put strength in me. In other words, if I got to argue with him, I'd change his mind about what's going on. There the righteous might dispute with him, so should I be delivered forever from my judge. So uh, what, uh, what uh, Job is, is saying here, that he wants to go and argue with God on his behalf. All right, now let's see what actually happens. Chapter 32, with regard to bringing this to an end. Job is going to be put out of his misery because he gets right with God and God vindicates him and he reestablishes his blessing and his hedge. Verse number two. Of chapter 32. Job's three friends answered, and now we have a fourth friend that comes on the scene. This fourth friend is a younger judge, and uh, his name is Elihu. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu. Last part of verse 2. He kindled it against Job because he justified himself rather than God. Now, therein is the problem of this third failure in the evidence test. If Job could have just stuck it out a little longer before he started complaining, if he would have just lasted and endured totally to the end until this time, but what did he do? He began saying, if I could just get in the presence of God, I'd argue with him about what he's doing. I'd call him unjust and things would be different. And Elihu said, Job, you're out, out of line. You're out of fellowship. Now, he justified himself rather than God. But know what else he did. He also got mad against the three friends uh, because they found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Time and again, these guys just didn't get it. Job said, no, I am not guilty of any sin. Uh, quit accusing me, help me, uh, uh, comfort me with God's grace. Pray for me, let's get through this together. You've come here to, to be physicians to me, then be that uh, rather than batter me, uh, trying to get me guilty of something I did not do. So Elihu waited till Job had spoken because they were elder than he. And Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men. His wrath was kindled. And Elihu said, I'm young, verse 6, you're old. Wherefore I was afraid and did not show you my opinion. I said, in other words, he's speaking to himself. Days should speak. The multitude of years should teach wisdom. He was right here. This is the rule rather than the exception. The longer a person lives, the more experience they have, the more wisdom they have. So this younger man sat back and said, I'm not going to say anything out of respect to my elders. These guys have lived longer. They know more than I do. And here, these guys were out of fellowship. They were no help to Job. They did not follow a spiritual protocol to strengthen their friends spiritually, which was what they should have done. So... He says in verse 10, hearken to me, I'll show you my opinion. And then he goes on down to, to tell them. 
exactly why they were wrong and why Job was wrong. Now let's go from here to chapter 40. Chapter 40, then to chapter 42, and we're done. Elihu was the first judge who answered Job, and he said to him, Here is your problem now. Up until this point, you didn't have a problem. You were right with the Lord. But now here's your problem. You're trying to justify yourself rather than God. You should just simply let God be God. And here is a situation where you simply turn over your life to him and let him make it right. Obviously, it's going on and on. You're praying about it. You are in fellowship. Turn it over to him rather than get bitter about it and blame him for your misery. You're justifying yourself rather than God. You're in the angelic conflict. Answer for the prosecution. So we have the, the great verse of Job later on. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's what he should have said. That was his doctrinal answer. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That was the answer for the third evidence test. If God wants to take me to the grave, and he wants to have a prolonged uh, session of misery until I go there. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But he didn't come to his spiritual senses until this younger fellow, Elihu, said, Wait one second, you're justifying yourself. You're in a battle for the Lord, and it's given to you on, on, uh, for the sake of Christ, not just to believe on him, says the Apostle Paul, but to do what for his sake? Suffer for his sake. You're in a battle. You've got a sacrifice. You're in a war. Sometimes you're going to get hurt along the way. So now God uh, breaks his silence. And uh, verse 6. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Gird up thy loins now like a man. I'll demand of thee and declare thou, uh, unto me. In other words, I want to know what's going on here. Up to this particular point, you've taken all my blessings. You've uh, passed the test, but now you're failing this third one. Note what he said Job was doing. Verse number eight. Will you also disannul my judgment? Now, what was Job doing? He was questioning God. Now, it's not wrong to question God to a point. Okay, Lord, now here I am in this. What do you have to tell me in all of this? Which direction should I go? But he began to say, well, God, perhaps you're not as smart as I thought you were. That's what he was questioning. God, I've been such a great believer, and now you're putting me through this. I, I, I begin to doubt whether you are as bright as people say that you are. What's going on here? That's the type of questioning that he had. Now, we've done the very same thing, and you know, I've had. God, how come you've let this happen to me? All right, last part of the verse 8. Will you condemn me that you might be righteous? He lost confidence that God in all things doeth well. And that was the third evidence test that began. He had a, um, a lapse uh, uh, in judgment. You'll excuse the uh, phrase that's being used now by our president. He had a lapse in judgment. But Job did. Because that's what he was trying to do. God had judgment and Job said, I want to switch your judgment, God. You don't know for my life better than me. You're putting me through this, and I question whether or not that's the best thing for me. And he failed, and God took him to task about it. All right, now come with me to chapter 42, and let's see what happens. We're about to close out the book of Job and see how he recovers from his, his failure. Verse number one, Job answered the Lord and said, here's his recovery. I know you can do everything and no thought is withholding from thee. Uh, with God, nothing's impossible. Uh, if you are in the center of his will, God will 
do everything to protect and provide with the exception of the angelic conflict, but even then, that's part of his will for our lives. So he said, who is he that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I've uttered things that I understood not. I, uh, I began to blame you and say things and speak out of turn. I really didn't understand it all, but I was in such pain and God, I just blamed you for it all. Things which are too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou un unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eyes have seen thee. Dear God, you have spoken to me. I comprehend. I know what you're all about. Now note what he did in verse number six. This is the recovery technique in the Old Testament even before the law. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. <laughs> Cute thing about him saying this is he, has, he was already in dust and ashes. <laughs> this, means, this means that he humbled himself even more. I mean, this guy did not have anything, and all of a sudden he says, Okay, God, uh, I'm going to repent in dust and ashes. Yeah, he'd have to get up to take a bath even to, uh, to repent in dust and ashes. But that's exactly what he did. He used a recovery technique. Yes, God... I understand now that I was trying to justify myself and I began blaming you and, uh, and being critical of you and questioning your will in my life. But I see now my error. And he repented. Now let's just read on down here very quickly because I think it's, it's profitable for us as we're closing out. And it was so after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, he spake with his uh, friends. And he said... Uh, my wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job has. You haven't given him accurate doctrinal information to follow. You kept giving him a guilt trip. You've done this, you've done the other. Instead, he said, no, I'm right with God. I'm in a test, which is what they should have um, accepted and gone on. Now, they, he made them to, um, to offer a sacrifice. Last uh, part um, uh, of the verse. My servant Job shall pray for you. Now get this. For him will I accept. He had the recovery technique. And one of the things that he had to do in order to show that he was right for God was to pray for his friends who caused him misery all this time. His friends had just gotten right with God and offering the sacrifice. And Job now had to pray for them. And he did that. Lest I deal with you after your folly. In other words, he is praying, God, uh, God, be sure and forgive them. I don't hold any grudge, don't you? And the thing which you have spoken of me, the thing which is right, like my servant Job, he did. Now, note what it says. Uh, they did according to the, as the Lord commanded them, and the Lord also accepted Job. Verse 10 the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. So here is the story as we're um, closing this out. Job was the most spiritual, the most influential, the richest and most powerful man at that time. He was a perfect man that was commended of God as being the greatest living but God had a head around him, and Satan said, the reason that he's serving you is because of the hedge. Take it down, and he'll curse you. As part of the angelic conflict, God called Job to a test case condition under, under three concepts. His, his health, his wealth, and his confidence in God, his spiritual confidence. Satan began the pressure, and Job, under the first and second instances passed with flying colors. He began to falter under the, sec under the third concept. His patience began running out. Finally, when he was confronted with Elihu's uh, testimony, Job, this is what you're doing. You are an example to me and all these men, and you've helped people spiritually around about for years. But now here's what you're doing. And Job said, boy, that you're exactly right. And he got right with God. God also came to him and said, Job, Elihu's testimony is right. 
He got right with God. His friends offered uh, uh, sacrifice. Job prayed for them, and God restored Job. But not just one fold. Look at verse 10. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Uh, so he was restored with double blessings. And here is the final comment as we uh, bring this to an end. And that is, Job would have never been blessed twofold had he not allowed God to reduce him to nothing in these three instances. But because God asked him to do something extra special in his sacrifice for the cause, there is always compensation, remuneration accordingly. And the verse of scripture that we um, uh, have reversed is, unto whom much is given, much is required, we reverse that and say, of whom much is required, much is given. And the test case condition of this for us to prove our point is God's servant Job.